When, so, okay, so hi, first of all, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Coffee and Eggs. So I have my coffee, coffee, and I have my eggs, eggs. So uh, we're going to have a little bit of fun time today. So this is actually really exciting, but I have to tell you, this is new. This is really, really, really new. So before we start, um, I want to make sure that everybody is in here. So I'm going to admit everybody, there's three people waiting and we are up to 40 people. I can't even believe this. This is unbelievable. Yay. So psyched. Yay. Hi, everybody. Okay. So I'm hoping everybody is in their pajamas because that is the point. And uh, so what we're going to do today is I'm going to walk through, um, I'm going to walk through a strategy today and I was trying to figure out like how to, how to do this in a way. I'm getting so distracted. <laughs> People are still being admitted. Um, trying to figure out a way how I could break down the potato, baked potato strategy. There's been a lot of questions around how to do this. And so the thing about the planning pyramid and or the baked potato plan, as I like to call it, is that uh, there's a whole bunch of different ways that you can use it. So what we're going to do is I'm going to show you kind of uh, the one main way to use it today, but I've decided to kind of break this up into multiple planning strategies so that this webinar isn't 16 hours long. So today's episode, this is strategy six. Um, everything that is um, that we talk about today, I will be posting on my YouTube channel and uh, I'll, I'll make sure that's available uh, today or tomorrow. So is everybody in? Okay, everybody's in. So here we go. The hashtag that we are going to use is the baked potato plan, which I'll come back to at the end. But basically, um, the strategy today is how to build a goal continuum. And this is going to be useful for, for many, many ways. Um, it's going to be useful for um, unit planning, lesson planning, assessment. So there's a lot of places we could go. It's like I say, it's a strategy that you get a big bang for your buck. So we are going to begin. <laughs> How do I make this go? Oh, down here. Look at you learning with me. Okay. So our strategy today is connected to uh, the video strategy, Dr. Big Potato. So if you haven't seen this video, make sure that you go um, take a look at it because it's not everything that we do today is going to be connected to this. So go watch it. All right. Here we go. So the planning, so the baked potato metaphor is connected to this strategy called the planning pyramid. And it's actually not a new strategy at all. It's from the nineties. Um, I actually have some articles that I'm going to post. Um, I'm going to put all of this on my website. So I'm going to put some articles in here that you can also refer to the planning pyramid. Um, it, it's very useful. It's also a universal design for learning strategy. So there's, there's a few reasons why this is useful, but basically here is the planning pyramid. Sometimes it's helpful to understand what this is by based on what it isn't. So um, oftentimes when we teach, we kind of try to get to the, we try and get everybody to the, to the same ending destination, and then we have multiple entry points. Um, this is kind of flipping that on its on its head a little bit. So rather than having multiple entry points, we're actually going to flip this and say, what if we had multiple exit points? And we actually don't have multiple entry points. We're all going to start together. And so this is how the planning pyramid starts. It says, what can we do um, so that all kids in the classroom are it's like, what do they have to know or do? And this is the, like the essential concept. It's the most important information. And like I say, you can see how this would connect to lessons, to, to units, to, to, to goals. Like there's so many connections, but here's the big idea. We want all of our kids to understand the most important information. Now that's going to be, uh, essential, but that's not enough, right? There's going to be kids who need more than that. So rather than trying to kind of take away, we're going to add on complexity. Most of your kids will get here. And so that's why I like this. It's all most. And then guess what? There's a third level of complexity. This is uh, the goal for few. 
the thing the thing I like if you look at this visually is that the goal for few when I first started to learn about this I thought it this I thought the, the triangle for few was for the few students who have disabilities or the few students who have special needs but actually that's not these students at all these are the students that need the complexity these would be your students who are gifted these are your students who need, who can like really extend themselves but if you look at this proportionally those students that need that extension are actually our smallest group because our students who need support actually fall into the all category. And so if we teach to the most complex version of a goal or an activity, we're actually teaching to the smallest group of our kids. And, this, and if you think about that, you know, as our classrooms become more diverse, the all becomes more important because you wanna make sure that everybody has success at the start um, and the chances of them actually moving to more complexity is higher than if they start and it's already, it's already too difficult for them. So I've talked about this a little bit already, but this is where the potato came from. So if you think about this in terms of the baked potato strategy, everyone, if the goal is to eat a baked potato, everyone needs the potato. So we're going to make sure that everyone understands and can do and can know what the potato is. And then we're going to add on complexity and then we're going to add on complexity again. So this is where this metaphor came from because just like the video said, it's way easier to add on toppings than it is to try and take toppings off afterwards. But let me tell you, friends, you have taken this to a whole new dimension. I have seen ice cream bars. I have seen popcorn bars. I have seen salad bars. Um, what was the one I saw the other day? Pancakes, um, pizzas. I mean, you guys are getting the idea. Like all of these things, what they have in common is a shared base. Um, and then you can always you can always add on and that's how the kind of the differentiation comes in um, If you listen to the podcast, I talked to my trainer Ed and I talked to my colleague Sarah Who Ed he does this when he works out right when he's training his people to say what can everybody do? You can always add on more weight you can always you know make a make an exercise more complex But you know in education we often do the total opposite We teach to the most complex thing and then we try and simplify our retrofit for kids But here is the thing Here's the thing, friends. If you've been in education for longer than four seconds, you know that a student would rather have behavior than to admit that they can't do something. So this is, is a very much a strength-based strategy. So let's keep going. Um, so why is this useful? Why is this strategy useful? So, so there's a couple of reasons. Um, we've, we've gone through a couple of them already, but it connects to UDL. It's strength-based. Um, it kind of takes that standardization goal that we're used to and kind of pulls it apart to kind of create a window of proficiency. So I have a, a few lists here. So if you've watched the five more minutes video in the past, you know that um, another metaphor that I like to talk about is called, is the airplane metaphor, right? So how do we make airplanes adjustable? Um, and this is a strategy to help us do this. So rather than having one standardized goal, we're gonna make it adjustable and actually say, how do we kind of pull the support, create a window, um, but really flip that idea on its head around rather than trying to get everyone to end together. We're going to start together, but we can always, <laughs> I hope you guys can't see what I'm doing. I'm trying to add people, um, start together, but have multiple exit points. This is about increasing complexity, not just increasing quantity. And I'll get into that in a second, but here's the big idea. We're, we want to start from access accessibility because it's way easier to add on accessibility than it is to kind of try and reduce or, or decrease um, decrease complexity once it's already started. Okay, another, you can call these things many things. You can call these things goal continuums. You, I've heard them being called a learner progression. Um, a a follow-up video we're gonna do on this is a learning map, which is basically, you know, how do we kind of like pull this apart a little bit so that it matches the range of our kids. Now, I have to give you a little disclaimer because this looks, it looks like a rubric, what I'm going to show you, but it's, it's different than a rubric. But in defense of rubrics, rubrics were actually originally designed to be this way. So I'm going to, I'm going to show you here. So here is the tricky thing that rubrics have become. Oops, close your eyes. Is that, and you know, I have to really defend rubrics here because rubrics, they, they didn't, they were, didn't start out this way. Like they actually were designed to be continuums, but then the internet 
got their hands on them and they built these rubric websites where you put in a goal and then this is what it does. It'll put the standard on the end and sometimes it's here and so sometimes it's on the left, sometimes it's on the right, but then all it does is creates deficits. So for example, if the standard is I can rhyme in my poetry, the column next to it is I can sometimes rhyme in my poetry and then it says I can't rhyme um, often another time you'll see to be like, I can frequently do this. I can sometimes do this. The problem with all of those verbs is that they all rely on frequency as an achievement indicator. Frequency is the least valid form of measurement. Okay. Just because you could do something multiple times doesn't mean that it's actually like valid. So what this is really is, is, is shifting to is, okay, wait a second. Let's get rid of the deficits because that actually isn't giving kids any feedback. Just because you're not doing something frequently enough doesn't mean you're actually giving them feedback about how to make their poetry better. So here is the alternative, ready? We're gonna get rid of this deficit. See you later, take them off. We're gonna start with the standard. Oh, I forgot this one. Okay, pause. So this, I pulled off the internet and if you've come to my presentations before, you've probably seen it, but this is exactly what we're talking about. On the screen, you're going to see various sandwiches, all right? Which sandwich would you want? The one on the right hand side that says, your sandwich went beyond expectations. You threw in some extra flavor and tomatoes and surprised the customer with a bag of chips. Great, thanks. Do you want that sandwich? Or, the customer wants a refund. Bread alone is not a sandwich. Okay, so if you even just look at the picture, all they've done is Photoshop erased versions of the sandwich. Now, this is the problem that I have with this. Is that, yes, this sandwich is absolutely a sandwich, but it's actually a really complex sandwich. And to be honest, I don't like tomatoes. So what if instead of assuming that everyone is gonna eat a complex sandwich, why don't we actually go back to the beginning and be like, yeah, okay, so bread alone isn't a sandwich, but it's also essential to a sandwich, right? Like you need to be able to hold the ingredients together. So rather than just telling kids, what they're not doing or that it's not enough, why don't we explicitly articulate what the bread is? Adding on complexity, why don't we explicitly articulate what the protein is? Adding on complexity, why don't we explicitly articulate what the vegetables are? And you know what? If we're evaluating sandwiches, chips and soda don't matter. So they shouldn't even be on there. That's like grading someone for neat printing. Okay, so here's how it works. This is the planning pyramid. I like to call it a goal continuum, and this is how it works. When you have a goal, now this is sometimes called a learning outcome, sometimes this is called a learning standard, depending on where you are, we're gonna put all of it there and then we're going to stretch it out. What is the most essential information in this goal? And the reason why I say essential is because you want all of your kids to be able to understand that essential information because if that's all they get, or demonstrate, they're going to be okay moving forward. I know this is hard to hear, but it's true. Not everyone has to eat a giant, huge sandwich to be considered a sandwich eater. I personally really like bologna and mustard on my sandwich. It's not very complex at all, but you know, I still meet the goal. So you can see here though, all of these arrows start together. They're all in the same place, but kids can have different exit points in terms of the level of complexity that they choose to demonstrate. Here is the most important information. Everyone is still taught everything. Even my bologna and mustard eating self, I still need to learn about vegetables, <laughs> obviously. Um, I still need to learn about other options because eventually I might want to do that. We all have a higher understanding comprehension than we do a demonstrating comprehension. This is why we read to babies. We do not read to babies because we expect them to decode back. We read to them because one day they will be able to read back to us, but we're exposing them to more challenging information and more challenging and complex and complex thinking. We're modeling that so that they can do that eventually. If kids are missing out on information that's more complex than they can demonstrate, then they're definitely not going to do it eventually. So this is really, really important 
all of our kids make no assumptions. We want to presume that they are competent and we are going to teach them every level of complexity. But when the time comes to demonstration, we want all of our kids to demonstrate the essential concept. And if they want to go further, they can. So let's get into this. How do we do this? How do we build a goal continuum for a goal or an outcome? So I've kind of broken this down into three steps and I'm going to walk you through this. So the first one is, you choose a grade appropriate goal. Now I say grade appropriate because I'm a supporter of inclusion and all kids need to be exposed to grade level curriculum. I don't even care what their disability is because this is high expectations. If a student is in grade four, we are using grade four curriculum. If a student is in grade 10, we are using grade 10 curriculum. This is so important. Now we are not reteaching. K to nine, we are making grade 10 accessible and that's how we do this here. So choose a grade appropriate goal. I don't wanna hear, but they're in grade 10, but they read at a grade two level. No, 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 that's not what this is about. Grade 10 curriculum and we are going to make it accessible. So here we go. Take your grade level goal and now we are going to look at, and I'm gonna show you this, uh, what you wanna look at, and this is called different things depending on where you are. So for example, in British Columbia, we call these elaborations, and this is basically a description about what the goal is. Other places, sometimes they call them achievement indicators. Um, they're called so many different things. Um, I, I can't possibly tell you what all of them are, but in, in every curriculum I've ever seen, there's a version of this. So you have a goal, and then there's descriptions about examples of how to meet that goal. The two that I'm gonna show you today are BC and Alberta, which are connected to the Yukon and the Northwest Territories, because that's where I do the most of my work. However, however, um, I am going to provide some examples about, um, so I'll show you at the end, but if you are in a place that's different than where I am, um, I'll, I'll still build some examples, but the ones that I show you today are going to be from those two. So once we look at our, those indicators, we're going to prioritize them in, ter in terms of what's the most essential piece. Sometimes I even think about it as what's the most important half, and then we're going to chunk the remaining of them into increasing levels of complexity. So let's look at this. Here is the actual strategy. It is the baked potato planning strategy. I even made it look like a potato for you. So as you can see, this is a planning pyramid. It's flipped upside down, which I will explain to you one day, but not today. So we want to start with our goal for all. This is your essential information. This is your potato. And then we are going to add on complexity. There's your butter. Then we're going to add on complexity. Here's your bacon. Now, on the left-hand side here, you see elaborations or achievement indicators. And under and under and over top of it is the fully loaded baked potato because all of the possible elaborations and achievement indicators are all of the possible toppings. So what we're doing is this is where we can start to do some planning. We list all of the elaborations here, and then we can actually organize them into levels of complexity. Friends, don't do this by yourself. Do this with people, especially um, people who have a subject area expertise in that area. I can tell you I'm very good at supports and strategies, but I'm not, I'm not a science specialist. And so if you're not sure, talk to someone. This, this strategy is, is made for collaboration. Okay, so here are the examples I'm going to walk you through today. I have some British Columbia examples and some Alberta examples. These are all based on real classrooms. Uh, I worked with real teams to make this. And so I tried to get a range from K to 12 um, or from primary to secondary. And I tried to kind of choose examples that are across curricular. Um, in Alberta, because I'm just starting to do this work, I only have math examples. But what I will do is as I get more examples, I will post them in the virtual folder that I'll show you at the end of this presentation. Okay, let's get into this. Let's start with grade two. So here's our three, go here are three steps. Choose a goal, prioritize indicators, chunk the remaining into complexity. Okay, I'm getting some Okay, so I have some really great questions in here. I'm gonna come back to them in a second. Okay, here we go. So in the BC curriculum, this is what the goals look like. Okay, so um, you know what? Let me actually just see if I can actually show you this on the actual internet. Okay, hold on, hold on. Share desktop and I'm going to get out the internet here. BC. Okay, so this is BC curriculum. We are looking at science grade two. So if I click on science grade two, 
this is what it looks like. So, I mean, this is, you'll need all of these sections for a big unit plan, which is what we're going to talk about in the next strategy. But today, because we're just zooming in on specific goals, in BC, the goals are, there's two different types. There's curricular competencies and there's content. The goals are the diamonds or the goals are the headings. Okay. So for this particular example, we're using this goal here, types of forces. That's the goal. That's the part, that's the outcome that we're evaluating. If you click on this blue word though, this is what we're talking about in terms of elaborations. Now this is the important part, BC. We do have to teach this goal but these elaborations are suggested indicators. This is not standardized. You don't have to go through each and every single one of these. However, we can use these to help figure out how are we going to uh, create a goal continuum. So what I've done is I have copied these elaborations and I have put them in. Oh no, don't close. Here we go. And I have put them in. Where's my Zoom? I have to share again. Oh no, share. PowerPoint. Look at me learning. Okay. Um, and what I've done is I've put those elaborations into a planning pyramid. So here we go. So we have elaborations, and here's the exact ones that are from right directly from the internet. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna be like, how do we take these different indicators and organize them in terms of um, accessibility and priority. And so this is what we did. So we've added a little bit of information too, because sometimes the elaborations don't give us enough information. So the content goal is types of forces. So our planning team came together and we decided that the most important information that grade two students need to know about forces is basically that the three big forces that we're targeting is falling, pushing, and pulling. And we want them to understand that those forces are going to shift, um, strength depending on the different types of materials that 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 are used with them and I'll, I'll explain to you in a second what we did with this adding on complexity we're going to start to introduce magnets and that the motion um the motion that an <laughs> listen to me you can tell i'm not a science teacher the motion that's caused by an object you can have you can have strong forces or you can have less strong forces so that idea of a kind of like that, that balance and unbalance. And then adding on complexity that force is affected by the shape of an object and that whole idea of air resistance. So this is an increasing in complexity um, progression. Now you can start to see now that these are gonna start to develop your little lessons. For this specific unit, um, we, the students are building monster traps. And so what they had to do was they had to incorporate these types of forces into their monster trap. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about that, um, in, in a follow-up episode because that's more getting to lessons. So that's it. That's it. See, elaborations, prioritize them. We're in business. Okay. Let's look at the next one. Grade two math. I love this one so much because math, there's a misunderstanding that math is linear sequential but it's actually very conceptual. And what's nice about it is that you can make the numbers either more or less accept, um, accessible. So here's our three, three steps, choose a goal, prioritize, and then chunk to increase complexity. So here we go. So I'm not gonna go back to the curriculum, but it was the same process. The actual goal is, um, <laughs> this should be up here. The goal is, is number sense and counting. So here we go. We have skip counting by two, five, and 10. We have quantities of hundred can be arranged and recognized and we have even an odd number. So prioritizing those. Oh, here we go. Number concepts to hundred. So the goal for all, we want all kids to be able to skip count by two, five, and 10. We want them to be able to do that counting forward. And we want them to understand benchmarks of 25, 50, and hundred adding on complexity. You can start counting in different starting points forward, and you can also count backwards or decreasing. And we're going to introduce a uh, place value. So knowing it's like over here. So knowing the value of the ones and the tens and how that affects your value of your number, um, adding on complexity, we can count backwards from any starting point and we can also pull numbers apart. And that's that decomposition piece. So you can see like, we're going to teach all of these things to all the kids, but what we want all kids to be able to know and understand is the potato, but that does not stop them from going as absolutely as far as they want. Isn't this so fun? Okay, let's keep going. Now, 
I included this example because sometimes, very often actually, there's a lot of students um, who are in a combined grade. Now, when I grew up, I was in a combined grade and it was called, um, it was a two, three split. And we're not gonna call it splits anymore because they're not split. Students are not split. Um, they are combined. And what that means is, is that your continuum can just be bigger. So if you teach in a combined class, just take the grade levels off and just include those indicators to make your, to make your um, continuum just even bigger. And then anyone can fall on any place on that continuum. Do not Please, please do not organize the classroom by East and West. Please do not say grade fours and grade fives. No, 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 no. All this is doing is creating a larger continuum for success. If there's grade fours on the grade five continuum, awesome. If there's grade fives on the grade four continuum, cool. It doesn't matter because the, the differences between them are so insignificant. And the benefit of a combined grade is that you just have more time to be able to achieve mastery. So BC is really nice about this because there's actually very, very little, little difference. So um, the great, so this one here is a curricular competency goal. And the thing about the curricular competency goals is that actually the elaborations are part of the goal itself. So if you look to um, the curricular competencies on the, on the website, it just kind of gives you examples um, or sometimes it doesn't give you anything. So what we've done is we've kind of pulled it apart to say, okay, so what are the actual examples of comprehension strategy? So it says use a variety of comprehension strategies before, during, and after reading, listening, or viewing to deepen an understanding of text. So here they are, prior knowledge, making predictions. And so um, I actually worked with the team on this one. And this one caused a lot of debate because we were just like, what do you actually need to be able to do first before you can do something else? Or what is kind of the most exciting accessible piece. And here's the thing is that this might be different depending on the teacher, but guess what? That's okay. You do you friends, because honestly, if you don't even split it apart and kids can confidently do half of these things, they're going to be okay moving forward because it's the exact same goal and the next year and the next year and the next year, we're going to expose them to so many different things. They're going to practice this over time. We don't have to get lost in the minute details. Excuse me, I'm choking. So I'm just going to have a drink of my coffee because it's coffee and eggs with Shelly Moore. Mmm, delicious. Do you see my mug? Look, it's a little identity wheels. It's on sale for chap at chapters for $7. Okay, let's go. Grade seven, social studies. Oh, this is okay. So here's an example of a goal that had no elaboration. So we actually just pulled it apart. So the curricular competency goal, assess the significance of people, places, events, or developments at particular times and places. If you actually look at that, those are the elaborations. So we just pulled them out. So we're looking at significance. That's the big goal. People, places, events, uh, developments, time, and places. And so, oh, I put places twice. That was supposed to be the past or time. So looking at this in, in terms of um, accessibility, we wanted everyone to understand that um, significance of like so significance is basically an influence of people, influence of place, adding on complexity, you can be influenced by time or a specific event. And then adding on complexity, it's, and this is a big part of social studies, is how does the, the past influence us today? So, you know, all, all of these ideas are around influence and significance, but, you know, increasing in complexity. Are you starting to pick up the pattern? We're almost done. So, new media, this is a new course. I loved doing this one. So here we go. Curricular competency goal. Respectfully exchange. Oh my goodness. <laughs> this is not, this is a social studies one. Just kidding. Copy and paste error. I don't have it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add it after. Don't you love real life errors? Okay. Alberta curriculum. So Alberta curriculum is actually, friends, I'm going to tell you, it's really easy. So if you're in Alberta, you're lucky. So what I'm going to show you in Alberta, what you need to be able to find in Alberta is called the achievement indicators. It's very important because it actually breaks down this for you. So I'm going to show you a math six example. So in math six um, and the achievement indicators, which you can down, you know what, let me just show you. I'm going to show you. Okay, ready? I'm going to show you the achievement indicators because I'm getting good at this. Safari, share. So 
this is what the website looks like k-9 math achievement indicators and so if you scroll down um i have the k-9 here one because i'm doing grade six but if you if say for example like the math 10 one if you type in uh grade 10 alberta math achievement indicators it'll come up as well so it's very very easy googling is very handy okay uh let's go back look i'm getting so fluent okay uh powerpoint presentation so the, the specific uh, goal that I am sharing with you today is this one here. So the specific outcome under the general outcome of developing number sense. So relate improper fractions to mixed numbers and mixed numbers to improper fractions. So that's the goal. That's the specific outcome that's being evaluated. Now, the achievement indicators, these are all a list of different achievement ind indicators, but I'm going to show you a very important word, Alberta. You do not... Let me rephrase that. Students do not have to demonstrate learning of all of these things for it to count because of this little word right here. See this little word? It says may. It does not say must. So these indicators may be used to determine whether a students, ha students have met a corresponding outcome. Students do not have to demonstrate all of these things, but textbooks are written that they are exams are written that they are so when we're actually teaching we have a little bit more flexibility than we think to be able to pull these apart so here's an example grade six math relate improper fractions to mixed numbers and mixed numbers to improper fractions here's the achievement indicators now i wish i could tell you that these are always in order of complexity but it's not always true if you ever design curriculum that would be a really good strategy just put them in order of complexity so what we did this is a group that i worked with last week in alberta we actually took these indicators and organized them into um, the strategy now the thing also that's important to know is that because the potato is the biggest it's the most important information you can put more goals there or indicators there than the other ones okay because like so for example like oops close your eyes this one has one two three four this one has six indicators and so you want at least three in the potato because that's the most important half okay uh, bc doesn't have this much detail and so we have a little bit more flexibility but alberta is more specific and so you know there's pros and cons to both so um how we organized it was uh using a model uh, show that an improper fraction is greater than one and then we put the two translate an improper fraction to concrete pictorial symbolic forms and a mixed number to concrete pictorial symbolic forms we wanted all kids to be able to do that adding on complexity um, basically being able to express and go back and forth between improper and mixed numbers and then um, the most complex is ordering all of those numbers on a number line which is definitely um, <laughs> something that I even have a hard time with okay last but not least uh, grade 10 math C example math common so this is an example I did actually just on Friday with a high school in Yellowknife who uses uh, the curriculum you know what I'm seeing the problem here this also isn't nuts okay so I switched computers and it didn't update so that one's not there either so my my oh this is so sad okay so my grade 10 new media and my grade 10 math it didn't upload with this version of the PowerPoint because I switched computers. So what I'll do is I will post those separately um, so that you can you can zoom in and see that I'll post all of these, but just so you know that, that they're not in this presentation. Nuts. Okay, here we go. So the planning pyramid, it is a learner progression. It's an additive model instead of a reductive model. And as soon as you shift away from reductive, it's becoming strength-based and you're going to have more success with your kids, especially around behavior. It is a strategy that builds on complexity. Uh, like we say, it's strength-based. The most important thing here is that we have to presume competence. Everybody is taught everything, even if they can't demonstrate it. Everyone needs to learn about bacon bits. Everyone needs to learn about sour cream, even if they don't eat them. The part here that I love is that if we teach this way, uh, students are actually in charge of the level of challenge that they want to demonstrate, which is, is such a huge piece of self-regulated learning. Um, kids need to know when they're ready for more, and usually we do that. So handing over control for kids to start to do that is a really big, um, a really big factor in student agency, which is the ultimate goal and why any of this matters. Um, Follow-up videos to this is going to be how do we now take this grade level goal continuum and pull it even further to create access and challenge points for students who may need support 
as an entry to the grade band, or maybe they're gifted, or maybe students who have a cognitive disability. How do we create access to the curriculum for them without creating a whole new plan? Um, and then we're going to have another one, which is what if we put all of these goal progressions together? Guess what that's called, friends? It's called the learning map. And then part four, this should say part four, is okay, now that we have these progressions, what's a strategy that we can actually build lessons from? So without even realizing it when I first started this coffee and egg strategy, which I haven't eaten. Um, this has now turned into a four part series. So what I'm going to do is I will post when the next webinar is because webinars are so fun. Um, and so you guys can register again. So stay tuned for that. All right. So we are going to pause. Um, I want you guys to have some eggs and drink a couple of coffee because I see some questions coming in. Take a minute, type some questions. I'm going to take a minute and read the questions and then I will choose a couple. Um, we're going a little over time here, so I want to choose a couple that we can answer. The ones that I don't answer, um, maybe I'll do a follow-up show to this so that uh, you can listen to them specifically. So let's just take two minutes. Um, I'm just going to have a bite of toast here. Look at it. Real good. Have a little egg. Mmm, eggs, eggs, cold, cold eggs. And I will check on the questions. Okay, two minutes, guys. Chat. Okay. Noon on the East Coast, good for you. This is going to be recorded and I will have it posted for you. Um, okay. Okay, so a couple questions here that I'm gonna walk through. So the first question that's coming up here is, um, I love the connection that someone has made. Charmaine, of course, this is you. Um, she says, I dislike the term short-term objectives because they rely on frequency instead of really thinking about the steps it takes to get there. So this is a really good point, and we're going to talk more about this in the follow-up video, but this is exactly the war on SMART goals that I've decided to take on in my life because if you look at IEPs, SMART goals, totally rely on frequency and like we say frequency is not a valid measure at all it's not enough it's I mean you can use it but it's not enough and so part of the goal for IEPs is how can we actually show IEPs to also be at levels of complexity that are um, connected to grade level curriculum so Charmaine of course I love that but we'll talk about more of that in the next video um, including parents as a part of the collaboration process oh my goodness absolutely especially with IEP planning and if you haven't seen it, um, the I, I have <laughs> through blood, sweat, and tears, my friends. Um, the next, my next book is being released, and it's exactly about this. It's about how do we um, do this process for IEPs, um, which absolutely is the parents and the families are critical, and the students are critical to that process. Okay, um, if you are in the United States, often a lot of these continuums are created for you, but they're often only used in the special education field because there's alternative assessments and alternative goals. If you are not in special education though, um, they're actually very useful also, um, especially if you're in a classroom that is including students who have disabilities because they're designed for kids with intellectual disabilities, but it shows a progression um, fr from absolutely any possible ability level. And so maybe I'll pull an example of that. I know I, there's some really nice examples um, that I looked at in Ohio, in Wisconsin. So, you know, maybe I'll do an American one because I love you Americans. Okay, here we go. Um, assessment. There's a question about assessment. So, at the specific goal level that we're talking about, um, you want this to be more formative because when you talk about lessons, that's when we're actually targeting specific goals. When you put all of these progressions together, which is going to be the, the video, the third video, which is creating learning maps, that is going to be a really useful tool for both formative and summative assessment and also self-assessment self for kids. So I want you to put the assessment question in your pocket because absolutely this this definitely connects to assessment and I was going to talk about it but that would be a whole nother hour because I don't want it to be misunderstood so stay tuned um, we're starting to get to assessment but uh, right now we're still at the formative stages um, Nina hi Nina 
uh, lots of examples. I'm going to keep posting examples. Um, is the baked potato planning strategy page available to print off? Yes. So um, I will show you at the end where you can get that information. Okay. Um, how do you respond to teachers who are concerned about grading on the report card? Well, Oh, grades. Um, I'm going to show you an example of how to grade and assess using this strategy, but I'm not going to do it today. So until then, just don't work with those teachers. Okay, moving on. Um, thanks for the Sunday professional community you're creating. Thank you. And how does a grade seven student understand grade level work as such as algebraic expressions when their skill level is different? Okay. So this is a very good question. And this is going to be the next video, which is how do you create access to a grade level goal for students who might have a cognitive disability? This is my passion area. This is my whole PhD research study. So what I'm gonna do is um, in the next video, I'm gonna show, I'm gonna show you exactly that because my research is all with high school. So if like, yeah, like you're in a math 10 class, you have a student who has a cognitive disability, how do you create that curriculum connection? So um, who asked me that? Margo, come back to the next video strategy because that, that's exact, that's the whole strategy. That's how do you create access. Um, university level context, yes. Oh, God, everyone needs to know this for sure. Um, I'm still teaching the typically smart goals I need to change. Yes, you do, Charmaine, but I got your back, don't worry. Okay, uh, Sarah, hi, Sarah. How do we support teachers to not put IPP on the report cards for students with complex needs so grading and assessing can be addressed. So Sarah, I want you to go watch the um, evidence log video. I kind of talk about that a little bit to say, okay, yeah, how do we, you know, assess IEPs or IPPs as they are in Alberta to show that they're still um, meeting those goals. But then, but then, then when we get to the assessment, I'll show you how we can actually uh, give a grade based on that. And so Sarah, go look at the IEP evidence strategy, uh, evidence log, and I'll look at that. Jane. Oh, Jane, we love you. I love you. Um, Jasmine, a student teacher. Yes, go get them. You can do it. Uh, cannot wait for the next one. We have a couple students. Yes, access points. Okay, friends, access points changed my life. Um, after I learned about access points, I realized that any curriculum can be accessible to any kid, which aligns very, very closely to my value of presuming competence. Um, and honestly, I have 100% seen it. And once you see it, you can't unsee it. Kids are so capable. And often the barriers are not their brain at all. It's just how we're organizing our curriculum. And, but I can appreciate that we weren't taught how to do this. So um, it's important to have this time together. Okay, friends, here we go. The last, the last part here. So here's your job. I want you guys to go practice this. I want you to start with one goal, one learning outcome. Um, if you have a specific request, so if you're watching this and you're not from BC or Alberta, send me an email, send me a comment, because what I can do is I'll build some examples from those places and post them so that uh, you can refer to them. If you are trying this out and you want to share in social media, the hashtag we're going to use is baked potato plan um, so that they'll kind of all go into the same virtual bucket together and then we can actually see each other's examples, which is really nice. Okay, so where you're going to find this video? On... On my website, fivemoreminutes.com, you're going to see a header called Inclusion Strategies. If you click that, this video will be Inclusion Strategy 6, and I will have in there the templates. I will have the video from this webcast. I will have the examples. I will have all of the things that I showed you there to be downloaded for you. Um, one last slide. Here we go. This is it. The Planning Pyramid Part 1, Building a Goal pro Progression. Hashtag baked potato plan. 9.45, we did it in 45 minutes. So thanks for coming over with me. Now that I know how much time this takes, um, I'm going to finish my coffee. Here's my coffee. I'm gonna finish my eggs. Here's my eggs. Here's my eggs. Um, thank you so much for meeting with me this morning on this beautiful Sunday morning. And um, I'm now on my way to Alberta. So I will see you all there. Go enjoy the rest of your day, friends. I can't wait to see you.